1. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 5, and excuse me, I said verse number 1. Let's start in verse number 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 17, the Bible says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would, but if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in this passage of Scripture, you're going to find out that as he's leading up to Galatians chapter number 5, he sits there and he talks about how that we need to love thy neighbor as thyself. In verse number 15, he mentions that if we bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And so he's got all these things, and of course he talks about uh, the perfect law of, uh, of liberty, and, and, but only use, li listen, just because we have liberty and freedom in Christ doesn't mean that gives us freedom to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? Understand that. That God didn't give us liberty. They're, that's what the world, they want to take, and, and, and a lot of these uh, so-called churches out there, they want to take this thing of, of liberty, and they say, well, that means that I can do whatever I want to do. And that's not what God has ever mentioned or intended in this thing of liberty. Now, when he talks about these things of liberty, uh, understand that he's telling us that I'm not supposed to take occasion of flesh, but then he says that we're to love one another uh, and serve one another in this passage of Scripture. Then in verse number 16, he mentions how we need to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, we're going to come back and say more about this. Now, there is this battle that's going on in your life and my life, this battle of the Spirit and the flesh. I mean, it's a battle. It goes on, and it's, it's roaring in there. And, and I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter. Uh, you could be in here tonight and saved one day, and there is a spiritual battle going on inside of you. I don't care if you've been saved 50 years. There is a spiritual battle going on in your heart and your life. I wish that I could tell you that every single time I woke up in the morning that I just got, was raring and ready to go to serve God. I wish that I could tell you that every time I opened the pages of the Word of God that I just couldn't wait to sit there and get something from the Lord. I'm going to tell you, my spirit wants to get something from God. My spirit that's within me, the Holy Spirit that's, that's ministering to my spirit, every human being, you know, body, soul, and spirit, right? And so uh, my spirit, I wish that every single time, my spirit wants to get something from God. My spirit wants to spend time in prayer. My spirit wants to tell people about Jesus. My spirit wants us to, to serve God with every ounce of strength I have. But every time my spirit wants to do those things, my flesh says, oh, it feels so much better to be in bed. Oh, but isn't it kind of scary walking up that door and knocking on that door? Who knows what's going to come on the other side of it? My flesh is saying, really? That kind of hurts on your knees a little bit when you're kneeling beside your bed and praying. That's what my flesh is saying. And so the Spirit's saying, pray. And the flesh is saying, don't pray. And the Spirit says, read the Bible. And my flesh says, don't read the Bible. And there's this battle going on. And I wish I could sit here and say that in my mind, there was never any bad thought whatsoever. But guess what? There are bad thoughts that go on in my mind because that's what we are. You can't even walk through a checkout line at a grocery store or Walmart without seeing a half-naked picture there. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't, you don't have to be much of a, uh, let's see, how am I saying this? You, understand that just you being a man and walking through that checkout aisle and you see that, it causes some problems inside your mind. And that picture is there. And I don't know how it works, but you could be laying in the bed in the middle of the night, wide awake, with your eyeballs pointed to the ceiling, and those pictures flash through your mind again. You know, that's the battle that we face. We all face that. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It means that's what we are as humans. That's what we face. Romans chapter 7, Apostle Paul had that same battle going on in his life. If it wasn't a battle, why did he write it to the church of Galatia? So we need to understand that that is a battle that takes place. But he says in verse number 18, if we be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So we understand here that, that, uh, that there is the law. So if we're led of the Spirit, you're no longer under the law. Now hold that thought. We're going to come back to it in a little bit. Now, I'm not going to go through the next few verses again. 
and go through every single one of these. But understand this. When we look through the verse number 19, verse number 20, and verse number 21, these are the works of the flesh. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, it's just the flesh. The Holy Spirit of God is not going to lead anybody to commit adultery. Okay? That is the flesh. All right? And we can go through each one of those, but we understand that that's what the flesh does. Now, the bad part of it is, when you read the end of verse number 21, he says this, And they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So when he says that they're, that they, they're not going to inherit the kingdom, you say, wait a minute, does that mean we have to attain unto sinless perfection? Well, you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 10 and 11 down through there, and he says, such were some of you, but we've been washed. Maybe you were that at one time, but now we've been washed. If God intended that we were going to be perfect, then he wouldn't have had to put 1 John 1, 9 in there. If we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're not talking about sinless perfection, but what we are talking about, it is our sin that sends every single one of us to the lake of fire. It's your sin that would send you, and it's my sin that would send me. Praise God, then, that what we have is the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all those sins. All right? So, I'm not going to sit here. We're not sitting here saying that once you are saved, you will no longer commit any sins because there are Christians that you know of. Well, look at somebody that was a believer in the Old Testament, King David, that committed adultery. Does anybody in here think that David is not in heaven today? We don't think that. You know, now I'm not trying to give us a, an excuse, but what I am saying is when Jesus Christ saved you and saved me, he saved me from sin, right? He saved me from the penalty of sin. I don't have to go to hell. And do you understand that he actually saved me from the power of sin? If, if that weren't so, why would he say, be holy for I am holy? Be perfect for I am perfect. You know what happens? We yield our members to those sins. We don't have to do that. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he makes a way for all of us to escape every single temptation. God is faithful to do that. So when we sin, it's because we want to sin. Now, I could say a whole lot more than that, but that's not really the thrust of the message tonight. Verse number 22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Do you know what? There's no law against these things that are the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we read a little bit ago that if we're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now we're seeing that the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, the Bible says here that there's no law against those things. All right? So those things, when we say the fruit of the Spirit, what we're saying is when the Holy Spirit is inside of you, what is going to pre be produced through the God, through your life, is love. What God is going to produce through your life is joy. What God is going to produce through your life is peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. All those things. And you sit there and you say, well, why is it that I have trouble loving this person over here? Well, could it be that perhaps we're not being led of the Spirit of God and because the Spirit of God is not working, our flesh becomes in control? Well, of course we're not going to love that person. You say, well, I can't uh, get uh, joy in my life. I see some Christians and they have so much joy and I, I don't have that joy in my life. Listen, the joy that you can have in your life is a direct result of the Spirit of God producing that joy in your life. So when we're living in the flesh, of course we're not going to have joy. All right, so let's go on because, we, again, we could preach on the fruit of the Spirit. But he says in verse number 24, and it says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So he mentions in verse number 24 that uh, our flesh was supposed to have been crucified with Christ. All right, now, when he gets into verse number 25, uh, he says, if we live in the Spirit. Now, can I just let you know that when he talks about living in the Spirit, what he's saying is this, those of us that are saved. I mean, the Bible does teach that uh, New Testament Christians, that the Holy Spirit indwells the New Testament believer. And so because the Holy Spirit 
is living inside of me and he has quickened my spirit and no longer am I going to have to face that second death. And because now I'm alive, I live in the spirit. Okay? So if I live in the spirit is really what we're saying is we're saved. He says here in the next part of that verse, let us also walk in the spirit. So if I'm a born again believer, shouldn't it then just be natural since I live in the spirit that I would also walk in that spirit? In other words, can I put it to you this way? If I'm saved, I should now live like I'm saved. Right? I mean, that's, that's what he's saying. So if I'm supposed to live in the spirit, which means then I'm supposed to walk in the spirit. So if I'm born again, then now I got to live like a Christian. If you go back to verse number 16, he makes the statement. It says, this I say, then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he says here that if I'm saved, I'm living in the spirit, then, then it's just natural that I should want to walk in the spirit. In other words, I live like a saved person. And if I'm walking in the spirit, living like I'm supposed to, then what's going to happen is I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, as long as I'm living in the spirit and I'm walking in the spirit, the flesh doesn't have a chance. It doesn't. You know, you sit there, and I'm going to tell you, it, this is an easier message to preach than it is to live. Because I've woke up in the morning on fire for God and by 10 o'clock already upset. How many times have you come to church the Holy Spirit moved in your heart and in your life. You come to the old-fashioned altar. You pray. I mean, you're on fire. You really want to do something for God. You get out on the road. You're on your way home. Somebody pulls in front of you. You hit your brakes, and then all of a sudden, now you're mad. Oh, that stupid idiot just pulled out in front of me. And you get this close to their... The reason I know this because I've done this before. You get this close to their bumper, and you go... I know, nobody else has done that kind of stuff before, have they? Isn't it amazing how you could be so filled with the Holy Spirit and two seconds later be so filled with the flesh? So don't think that this isn't going to be a constant battle. That's why the flesh lets against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. This is a battle that you will face all your... I used to think when I was, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old and, and I would be those, those early years to where I was really on fire serving God and really wanted to do something for God and I'd, I'd see some of the older members of the church and it just seemed like I would go up to them and, and I'd be like, how do you do it? I'm like, they could sit there through the most boring sermon on planet earth and they'd never fall asleep. They'd sit there and it just seemed like nothing shook them and nothing bothered them. And I'd say, how is it you have all this patience? And how is it you can deal with all these problems? And I'm thinking that somehow, some way, some of them has to rub off on me so that I can gain what they have. Only to find out that on the outside they've learned to control themselves, but they were having the same struggles I was having. They just learned how to control it a little bit better than I had learned. And then I thought, well, that's all right. But, you know, I'll figure this thing out. The older I get, I'm thinking it's going to get easier. And I'm finding out the older you get, it gets harder. You have more to answer for to God. We've, we've drawn closer. We've done all these things. We've, we have more responsibility. You have more people looking up to you and all these things. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't get any easier. It gets harder. If you think this Christian life is just uh, something that is for uh, us to just, uh, just kind of prance our way through and think that it's going to be uh, super easy then I got another thing coming to you. Because that's not the Christian life. It's difficult. Your flesh and your, because your flesh will never, ever, ever concede to the fact that the spirit is stronger. It will never sit there and say, all right, I give up. Your flesh will never do that. Our spirit gives up and we give in to the flesh. But I'm going to tell you right now, your flesh never gives up. It is always a constant battle. Now, if you live in the Spirit, then you know what needs to happen? You walk in the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, God promises, ye shall not fulfill the lust of... That is a promise of God. That if I'm walking in the Spirit, that I would not fulfill the lust of flesh. You know what God is saying? He's saying this. If I'm saved, and I'm living like I'm saved... Walking in the Spirit, being as close to Him as I... Isn't that what every born-again Christian is supposed to be doing? Living as close to God as possible? Fellowship, fellowship with Him all the time? Getting as close to Him as, as you possibly can? Trying to please Him in every area of your life? So if we're walking in the Spirit, 
then the flesh will not be fulfilled in our lives. But the amazing thing of it is, when we go down to verse number 18, he says this, but if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So if we're led of the Spirit, we're no longer under the law anymore. Now, isn't that amazing? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, uh, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he mentions, if we're led of the Spirit, we're not going to be under the law anymore. Well, some say, well, of course we're not under the law. We're in the New Testament. And so we're not under the law anymore. Well, you know, it's amazing how people pick and choose what they like. Do you know that modern day Christians think that it was hard in the Old Testament and it's supposed to be easy in the New Testament? Look at all of what God required of them in the Old Testament and he's really let up on us in the New Testament. You know, that's not true. Can I give you one example? In the Old Testament, he said, in the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. In the New Testament, he says, if you look at a woman to lust after in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. Is that stronger or is that looser? No, the New Testament is stronger. You know why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and go on people? He would come down, he would do a work in some, and then he would leave. There are a few examples of Old Testament believers that actually had the Holy Spirit for long stretches of time and all those things. I mean, uh, the fact is, for the most part, he would come and go. But in the New Testament, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ promised on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit would come and empower his churches, that, that what happened there is now the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And we have power. Do you understand Acts chapter 1, verse number 8? And ye shall be witnesses. You know, it, can somebody look that up real quick? Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. I was going to quote it, but my mind went, whoo. You know what a lot of people do? What a lot of people do is this. Well, you know what? We need to have God's power. Well, according to Acts 1.8, we already have it. Well, that's amazing. Well, why, what, what's our problem then? If we already have the power of God, the Holy Spirit, I mean, once the Holy Spirit come upon us, did, didn't he promise power? So, so then, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, we want power in prayer. We want power in everything else in our life. But what he's saying is, we need to go out and, and witness. Well, if we're not witnessing, that's a problem. But here's the, here's the main issue. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we're walking in the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know what's happening? Is we have all the power of God we need dwelling in us right now but we're giving into our flesh. And so because we're giving into our flesh, we go and we read verses like, but if you've been led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So then that means we want to take that and say, well, if the Holy Spirit's leading me, then I, no, listen, the Holy Spirit is never, ever, 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 you get this? The Holy Spirit will never lead you outside of the boundaries of this book right here. Why would God give us a book and then turn around and lead you to do something outside of this book? All right? So when he says here that we're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, the reason he can say that is because he understands that with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we're going to not need the law anymore. You know, if the Holy Spirit's inside of me, I don't need for somebody to say, thou shalt not commit adultery. Because the Spirit's going to say, don't commit adultery. If, if I have the Holy Spirit... And, and he's leading me, and I'm walking in the Spirit, I don't need the law to tell me, thou shalt not kill. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead me to kill somebody. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead me to commit adultery. He's not going to lead me to commit fornication. He's not going to lead me to lie. He's not going to lead me to say uh, unkind words. The Holy Spirit's not going to do that. But if you want to go a step farther, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, but then when we continue on with that, but the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So when we take those ideas of all the things that God says here, and he says these nine things, against such there is no law. So because of the Holy Spirit, I no longer have to be under the law. And if I'm led of the Spirit and producing these things from the Holy Spirit in my life, then there is no law against that. Now you sit and you think about all these things. Then if you go back to verse number 14, the Bible says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Somebody want to say the last part of verse 14? That's exactly right. You know all the law can be fulfilled by us loving our neighbor as ourselves. I think it's Romans chapter 13, verse number 10 says, uh, that love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Listen, uh, if you loved your neighbor the right way, would you commit adultery with his wife? If you loved your neighbor the right way, are you going to premeditate his uh, murder him? No. If you loved your neighbor the right way, are you going to steal from him? If you loved your neighbor the right way, are you going to lie to him? See, you don't need to be under the law anymore. Because God tells us that now we're being led of the Spirit of God. But understand this, the Spirit's not going to lead us anywhere other than what this book has to say. Well, it all comes down to this then. He mentions these works of the flesh. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we could go through all those works of the flesh, and I know I keep going back to the adultery because that was the first one. But the fact is, what about hatred and wrath? What about these things of uh, envyings? I mean, we could spend a lot of time on those issues. And it all boils down to this. Are we going to live in the Spirit, which means then we walk in the Spirit, which means then we're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh? Or are we going to say, you know what? I'm going to give in to my flesh and do the works of the flesh. That's really what it boils down to. And so we have to decide, which are we going to do? Which one of those things are we going to live in our life? We can sit here all day long and say, you know what? I want to read my Bible. I want to pray. I want to come to church. I want to give. I want to be a good Christian. We could talk about that all day long. Do you understand also that I could go through all the motions? And even as a pastor, there were times in my life that I did go through the motions. You'd get ready to preach. You'd come up and preach. You'd go knock on doors. You'd say the right things, you go through all those things, and you know what, it was just going through, but on the inside, it was all dried up and, and, and all frizzled up and burnt and to a crisp and didn't want to do any of it. But somehow we learn that if I act this way on the outside, it fools everybody else. Well, it don't fool God. And do you know eventually what's on the inside does come out? So what we have to make up our mind is, I'm born again. That means I'm going to live in the Spirit. And that means I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to live like I'm supposed to. And if I walk in the Spirit, guess what? I won't have to worry about fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That's just a promise of God. It's an exciting promise, isn't it? Because the fact is this, when you read these things, we have a choice. Go back again to the end of verse number 13. The last line of verse 13 says, But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now get verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Isn't that amazing? So we have a choice. Serve one another, love one another, bite and devour one another. When you put it that way, it doesn't seem like much of a choice, does it? Let's just serve God. Heavenly